You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Imagine a world where you're always one step ahead of cyber threats, where your defenses are impenetrable because you see what others don't. Welcome to Team Cymru's Threat Intelligence Solutions. With real-time access to the world's largest threat intelligence data ocean, they enable you to turn the tables on attackers. Transform your security from reactive to proactive through accelerated threat hunting and incident response, made possible through automation. Empower your team with visibility and insights to start defending your organization like never before. Team Cymru. Be the hunter, not the hunted. Learn more at team-cumry.com slash cyberwire. That's team-cymru.com slash cyberwire. One of the things that I love when talking about the aerospace sector is that people are building real physical things. Spacecraft, sensors, stations, spaceports. And coming from the tech world as I have, it's refreshing to be talking about atoms and not just bits. But of course, it's not an either-or situation. You can't really have one without the other nowadays. And today, our news just so happens to have a software focus for the otherwise hard tech of space. Today is March 18th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. NOAA awards Parsons a $15.5 million contract to support Trax. Maxar to finally launch its Worldview Legion satellites. SAIC announces fiscal year results. And our guest today is Gianluca Rodolfi, Chief Business Officer at Satelliot. We'll be discussing Satelliot's 5G core in AWS and how it interconnects with other mobile operators. Stay with us. Happy Monday, everybody. And we're starting our show today looking at a brand new report from cybersecurity firm ReSecurity that's titled Aviation and Aerospace Sectors Face Skyrocketing Cyber Threats. And the report points to the increasingly interconnected aerospace sector, from design to supply chain and operations, as one of the reasons for the more than 600% increase in cybersecurity attacks on the aerospace industry in 2022 alone. And more recently, also, the ongoing importance of space assets in the war in Ukraine has also certainly put space infrastructure in the hacker spotlight, not to mention the continuing discussion about designating or not designating space as critical infrastructure. That has also piqued the interest of hacker groups looking to extort aerospace operations with ransomware attacks. But the increasing use of internet-enabled devices, and that's good old-fashioned IoT for those of us keeping track at home, That has, in the words of this new report, drastically amplified the attack surface for aerospace organizations at more granular levels of their supply chain. So with this report in mind, it felt like a good time to bring in N2K's own chief learning officer, Jeff Welgan, for his take. You know, honestly, my my first initial impression was this is not that surprising. We've we've known that aerospace industry, space industry, uh, companies have been long targeted by adversaries, you know, and it's, if you're uh, in the industry and you're building really novel new technologies or platforms for the government, certainly foreign adversaries are going to be interested in what you have. So you're a target there. And then I think, you know, from a, from a different angle, if this is, you know, focused more on the, the civil side um, and focused on like airport security, uh, airline security, et cetera, there's other motivations from other cyber adversaries like cyber criminal groups um, who want to monetize things. So if you can, you know, put a really great ransomware out there and lock something down and it disrupts your industry significantly by causing massive delays at an airport or for your production line as a as a company building jets or airplanes, et cetera, 
then you're going to be more motivated to pay the ransom and just, you know, hope that solves the problem and you can get back to doing your business. So I, I wasn't entirely shocked by by the report. I'm curious what hackers specifically, or hackers, attackers, adversaries, whatever tra- phrase we want to use, there are interesting and unique things that attackers want to take advantage of. As you mentioned a little bit, like leveraging, you know, the fact that we're so reliant on it. Um, is there anything else that they're looking at, you think? Yeah, I, I would say supply chain is a huge piece of this as well. Because you think of like the things that we use in the government, you know, whether it's a platform or technology for, you know, our U.S. military or for large programs like space, and you make that connection into, you know, aerospace industry at large, the supply chain is interconnected there. You know, whether it's an engine or whether that's a, technolo- a piece of technology that goes on into or on or supporting a platform, they are oftentimes supporting, you know, something larger or something more government e or classified or military-like. So if you can infiltrate components of an organization to really understand the supply chain and then do adversarial supply chain operations on that, then that is, you know, another really uh, appealing threat vector for for cyber adversaries. So it's really important. Uh, and, and supply chain is is a really complex thing to understand and track and manage. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and I know that report also mentioned that many aerospace companies are feeling the heat ever since there's been this discussion about designating space as a critical infrastructure sector. Uh, and there, people are kind of like, we don't want that attention because attackers are looking at us more. Um, but I think it's been happening even before that discussion was ramping. It's just, it's been just, as you said, it's a very appealing area for an attacker to go after. Well, especially as we're moving our comms more and more out, away from Earth itself, right? Like comms have been there for a long time, but like as more technologies come uh, on board where we're utilizing satellites, mesh networks, et cetera, that is a whole new opportunity for, you know, cyber adversaries or hackers to kind of get in involved in those environments so that they can leverage it for whatever use that they want to leverage it for. So it, we'll see more and more of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we've sort of <laughs> scared everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. Um, so, okay. What, what do we realistically do about all this? This is a very complicated problem. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, I think most cyber issues are people issues. Um, so, you know, certainly technology has a, a, a place here and there's a technology that can help advance all the things we want to advance for our business. There's technologies that can help protect and monitor those things. But, you know, at the end of the day, people are behind everything. They're building the technologies or they're implementing the technologies or managing the technologies. They're managing other people and programs, supply chains, et cetera. So I would take a a recommendation for most organizations to really understand your talent strategy, really look at the roles that you have that have this intersection of cyber or security involved in it, and then look at what's really required for that role at the certain level within the industry or the product line that we're actually uh, focused on here Um, and make sure that your talent strategy is in line with your business objectives and your business goals. And security should certainly be one component of that. So once you understand really your job role expectations, then you have the data in front of you to start making decisions on, you know, do we have the right people? Do we need to bring in more people? Do we need to upskill people? You know, do we need to let some people go? Um, you know, those are all decisions that can be made uh, when you you have the right um, information in front of you. Mm, so that's that's the end result. But getting to that point, where where do you start with that? That sounds like a sounds like a lot to take on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it takes focus, right? So you really want to you know look at each and every single job role that you have. I, I would say in the cybersecurity space. And then profile those roles out based on the expectations you have for the business. And then, you know, you want to look at current state, but you also want to look at future state. If you know that your product engineers are, you know, bringing on new cloud technologies uh, and integrating the the engineering component of their work into a cloud environment, um, what does that mean? Or well, what skills do you need to do that successfully? And then, you know, profile that out. And then the next natural step is to ask yourself, well, do we have the right people for that? Are, are people skilled in those things? And go through the process of, of answering that question. And there's a number of ways you can get to that answer. You know, whether it's a diagnostic or assessment or a self-assessment or a managerial review, 
you know, those are, or, or labs. There's a lot of things that you can kind of do to get better granularity or focus on, on uh, where you're at currently with your, with your skills. Maria, another really important thing I think that's relevant for this industry is that a lot of these companies have positions there that require security clearances. You know, if you're Boeing and you're doing uh, government work, government programs, the people who are working on those next-gen aircraft or platforms um, likely have to have security clearances. And I I bring that up because it's just one more challenge for this industry when it comes to, you know, having the right people, um, because now their, their, their people pool is much smaller. You have to find not only people who are really good at what they do, but also are cleared or are clearable. And, and that can be one more additional constraint for, for the industry. Thanks so much again, Jeff, for joining us today. Moving on to other stories now. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has awarded a $15.5 million contract to Parsons Corporation for systems integration and cloud management services for the Traffic Coordination System for Space, also known as TRAX. TRAX aims to be a modern, cloud-based IT system that will provide basic space situational awareness and traffic space coordination services to both private and civil space operators. As the systems integrator, Parsons will develop the software backbone for the operational TRAX platform, including the space situational awareness data repository known as TRAX Oasis and the application layer called TRAX Skyline. Maxar Technologies may finally be launching its first Worldview Legion satellites after years of delays. In late 2022, Maxar targeted a January 2023 launch, but as often happens in this industry, that date slipped, and there were no further updates in 2023. The company recently announced, though, on social media that the first two of six planned high-resolution Worldview Legion satellites have arrived at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, and that's ahead of liftoff as soon as April aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The anticipated Worldview Legion constellation will provide a boost to Maxar's Earth observation capacity. Science Applications International Corporation, also known as SAIC, has announced results for the fourth quarter and full fiscal year ending February 2, 2024. And the results are a mixed bag. Revenues for the quarter decreased $231 million compared to the prior year quarter. According to SAIC, this was due to a whole host of reasons, including, and I'll list them for you, the sale of the logistics and supply chain management business, the deconsolidation of the forfeiture support associates, five additional working days in the prior year period, contract completions, a reserve on a customer receivable related to a program completed prior to fiscal year 2022, partially offset by a ramp up on new and existing contracts, and a partridge in a pear tree. Just kidding. That said, the press release stated that when adjusting for the impact of all those factors that I just mentioned, revenues increased by approximately 7.7%. SAIC's estimated backlog at the end of the fiscal year 2024 was approximately $22.8 billion, of which $3.5 billion was funded. The company was recently awarded new federal contracts, which they hope will turn around their current fiscal year results. The Ariane Group has shared images of the main stage and the upper stage of the Ariane 6 rocket in the Launcher Assembly Building, also known as BAL, at the ELA-4 Launch Complex in French Guiana. The central core is made up of the main stage and the upper stage, assembled together with an interstage interface structure. Once assembled, the central core will then be transferred from the BAL to the launch pad, ahead of the Ariane 6's inaugural launch, which is, fingers crossed, expected this summer. And we finish with some sad news for today. Former NASA astronaut Thomas Stafford has died at the age of 93. Stafford was selected as an astronaut in 1962 and flew to space four times. He traveled to the moon on Apollo 10 and later led the first international space mission carried out by the United States and Russia in 1975. During that mission, 
he famously shook hands in the spirit of peace with cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, who later became a lifelong friend with Stafford. Stafford later recounted that famous handshake, saying, We estimate over a billion to a billion and a half people around the world saw me shake hands with Alexei and said, Look, if people like this can work together, we can work together on a lot of things. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson shared this on social media, that today, General Tom Stafford went to the eternal heavens, which he so courageously explored as a Gemini and Apollo astronaut, as well as a peacemaker in Apollo Soyuz. Those of us privileged to know him are very sad, but grateful we knew a giant. Ad Astra General Stafford. That's it for our Intel briefing for today. Head to the selected reading section of our show notes to find links to further reading on all the stories we've mentioned in today's briefing. We've also added a preview of the research that's headed to the ISS later this week on the 30th SpaceX resupply mission and links to two announcements from the satellite conference, which is going on right now this week in Washington, D.C. Hey, T-minus crew. Every Monday, we produce a written intelligence roundup. It's called Signals and Space. So if you happen to miss any T-minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signal, no noise, straight in your email inbox. You can sign up for Signals in Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. Barcelona-based satellite IoT provider Satelliot is the first satellite communication service provider to offer global satellite IoT connectivity with 3GPP release 17NB IoT, or Narrowband Internet of Things satellites. That's a lot of jargon to say that they aim to be the first company to connect all devices using 5G technology from space. And our guest Gianluca Redolfi joins us to explain further. First of all, thanks uh, a lot for having me. My name is Gianluca Rodolfi. I'm the CCO at uh, Satelliot. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gianluca. I appreciate it. Uh, and we've we've spoken with Satelliot before. It was a little while ago. Uh, and a lot of things have happened in, uh, in the intervening months. So uh, there were some really interesting announcements about some new things that Satelliot's been doing in terms of building out its network and working with new partners and bringing new uh, capabilities to the forefront. So could you tell me a little bit about what Satelliot has been up to since maybe late last year? Yes, of course. So uh, just as a reminder, so Satelliot is the first uh, satellite constellation providing 5G from uh, standard 5G from uh, space, which basically means that uh, this enables any device on Earth to connect seamlessly between uh, a terrestrial cellular network and the satellite network. So no more specific devices for satellites. We've been working uh, now five years on this. The standard has been approved uh, a little bit more than a year ago. So the the situation that we have now is that we are seeing uh, uh, happening in the market that the devices are upgraded to the release 17, which is the new uh, feature that includes the North Wrestler network. Our constellation uh, uh, provided test environments for, for such uh, devices, and uh, we're launching new satellites this year. And this is going to bring uh, us to the first uh, commercial services by the end of this year. That's, that's the, the news. Excellent. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. One of the things that caught my eye when I received some of the press releases about uh, what you all have been up to, there are a lot of different partnerships that have that your, your company has formed. Um, can you tell me a bit about some of the different partners that you're working with? You know, when, when you are developing a satellite uh, constellation and you also want to be GSMA, basically you do much more than just uh, being a satellite. So there, there are a lot of other parts, specifically on, on the ground. Okay, So you need to have uh, a ground stations, you need to have uh, to be seen like uh, a carrier yourself. So we had to set up our own uh, core network like any telecom operator. 
So in all these aspects, we've been uh, partnering with um, well, our partners and we've been also yep. developing on it. Okay. So one that uh, you mentioned is AWS. Uh, this is public. Uh, we've been uh, working uh, on, uh, and actually we've been announcing that it has been the first time also in history that the narrowband IoT NTN has been done uh, over AWS. So this has mm. been uh, developed and that's what we're using as a uh, core. But at the same time, uh, we're also uh, using other partners uh, for uh, for the ground station. Uh, we're partnering with uh, KSAT, we're partnering with um, uh, Rodenfarts, GCF, so all these uh, ecosystem uh, of uh, making it possible to make the communication to the satellites, testing the devices to make sure that they are working and the interoperability tests are fine with our constellation. Yeah, so that's all the ecosystem. And this is not this is not just one company. So you need a lot of uh, a lot of uh, partners to make it happen. I'm curious uh, sort of how that partnership with AWS came to to be. Um I'm I, I mean, I know they're a big name and all that, but uh, at the same time, I, I'm just I'm just so curious about how that developed and, and how you all work with them. Well, AWS is the um, is the key the key provider of um, uh, cloud, okay, cloud solutions. So we started working with them uh, probably around three years ago. We worked very close to them to to make possible to make possible the developments. Uh, we had a very nice support. And um, we worked very closely, and that's and that's what we achieved. Um, I think we announced this like um, a year ago that uh, we we achieved this uh, this milestone of having the the, the first narrowband IoT core on uh, on AWS. And you you mentioned a little bit about the long term strategy and vision for the company. Could you just go in a little more detail about um, what you see Satellite enabling over the long term? With a lot of pleasure, because uh, our um, our mission is to um, to be able to connect every single uh, use case, any single device, any single person that wants to be connected in any unconnected area. Now, you know the issue that exists so far existed so far is the fact that satellite connectivity has been uh, proprietary, has been so expensive so demanding you know, on specific uh, hardware that at the end it's, it's still too expensive and so the, it's very limited the amount of uh, uh, specific use cases that can really pay for it in terms of uh, dollars in terms of uh, power consumption so what we are uh, providing to the to the world by the way we have coverage everywhere uh, in in the planet is uh, very very affordable okay almost a terrestrial uh, price point with the same device which is terrestrial uh, device the possibility to connect also where there's no cellular network so our final goal is to connect the unconnected and to have uh, all the devices connected uh, everywhere ultimately we are doing it because we think that the connected world is a better world I just wanted to make sure if there's anything else that you wanted to mention about what Satellite's up to or anything, really. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to say it. Well, I would say we'll be mentioning uh, basically everything. Aspirationally, I, I, I'm very happy that this is happening. That the standard, the standard of 3GPP, which is the organization that sets the standard the, uh, on, on the telecom side, uh, release 17, so the standard that includes the NTN exists. And uh, I'm hoping that really in the ni- n- next five to ten years, the connectivity will be so a commodity as it is on terrestrial, also on satellite, that basically there will be no disconnect nowhere in the world. We'll be right back. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. 
SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Welcome back. We do love a bit of space history here at T-Minus, and this past weekend on March 16th, we celebrated the first liquid-fueled rocket launch. Anyone have any idea what year that was? Well, we're talking 98 years ago, in fact, in 1926. And of course, we're referring to the launch by Robert Goddard. Now, Goddard named the vehicle Nell, reference to the title character Salvation Nell, from a 1908 play by Edward Brewster Sheldon. Huh, I didn't know that. The rocket itself, which was fueled by gasoline and liquid oxygen, was launched on a farm in Auburn, Massachusetts. Goddard designed the rocket with the engine on top and the fuel and oxidizer tanks below. Needless to say, it's a bit of an unusual configuration, but it's one that he thought would provide more stability. Nell rose 41 feet in the air during its two-and-a-half-second flight, landing 184 feet away in a cabbage field. A commemorative historical marker sits upon the launch site today, in fact, which just so happens to be right on the ninth fairway at the Packachaw Golf Course in Auburn. Let me tell you that Robert Goddard has a special place in our hearts here at T-Minus because although he had his first launch in my home state of Massachusetts, he found real success in Ellis's home state of New Mexico. Goddard outgrew his facilities in Mass, and the Guggenheim family provided funding for a new and larger facility in Roswell, New Mexico. Surprisingly, the U.S. government showed little interest in his rocketry research before World War II, but other nations like Germany and the Soviet Union studied his results to advance their own rocketry programs. Speaking in 1963, Werner von Braun reflected on Goddard's contribution to the space program, saying his rockets may have been rather crude by present-day standards, but they blazed the trail and incorporated many features used in our most modern rockets and space vehicles. That's it for T-Minus for March 18th, 2024. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd always love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. And we're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K's strategic workforce intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our associate producer is Liz Stokes. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazes. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. We know there's an experience gap in cybersecurity, and companies are often enamored with the idea of building teams of superstars. 
but focusing on a team of unicorns just feeds the talent gap. Join N2K's Simone Petrella and Intuit's Kim Jones on Wednesday, March 27th for an online discussion about the pivotal role security leaders play in shaping the security workforce landscape and how we can start showing up for the future of our industry. Visit our show notes for details and to register. <laughs> 